Do you guys, do you guys, have you ever had black girlfriends? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, have you ever had white girls? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. What's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> We love them all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, Just, really? We love them all. Yeah. That means white. Who gives you? The black girlfriend effect. This oh, is you don't know about glow up the other culture. Yeah, so you'll see a, a guy who's had a black girlfriend, all of a sudden he's got buzz cut, like, yeah. clean yeah. shape up. Nah, yeah. 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 They yeah. shave their hair because they start losing it. Because they start stressing <laughs> yes. around this black girl complaining about shit all the fucking time. That's why they got to shave their nah, hair. Nah, bro. White guys with black girlfriends, they, they, they grow a beard they because their there's up. more cushion when they get slapped out of the Sometimes the funniest thing to say is me. Who would have guessed that I am on the internet defending shits and gigs? After criticizing them early, some of you may have not seen. Boy. What courageous. The way that would be on my dating profile. Mm. Platinum gay? Mm. Yeah, that's, you know, you're authentic. You probably can tell from the montage, the title, that I'll be talking about the controversy that happened recently with Andrew Schultz and Shits and Giggles. How did it happen? Why did it happen? What's it really about? Are we policing comedy? So I have criticised shits and gigs before. I think they're a little bit fake in my opinion. I think sometimes they come across that they're pandering. In my opinion, for laughs at the least, they're not pandering very really bad. But I'm not the biggest, biggest fan. I haven't watched many episodes of their podcast. I did for this episode. So I've got to put that out there. So you know that I may not be the most objective. However, I realise what is happening to them is somewhat unfair. I think we are entering a place where we're policing comedy and maybe not understanding what comedy is about. I believe sometimes a lot of the outrage has its own ulterior motive. I think maybe their culture, the European black dude culture might be different than ours. Before we get into all of that, I'm going to need you to do me one massive favour and that's please like, comment, share and subscribe in order the channel to grow. It's going to need your support. It's going to need your subscriptions. Your subscriptions are even more important than the viewership. That's a weird thing to say. That's a really weird thing to say. But subscribe. Put into the comments what you like. Put into the comments what you don't like. Things that you think can improve. Things that you think were missed out. Things that you enjoyed. Without further ado though, let's get into the episode. So we're just all up to speed about what is going on. Shits and Gigs, they're a podcast from the UK with James and Fouad, who have become somewhat a sensation due to their unique comedy style, the way they pick up and discuss stories, the advice they give at the end, the way they discuss dilemmas. I think their interplay with each other is actually genuinely quite charming and it's where most of the core fan base come for they like the way those two talk and have a dynamic they appear in my opinion to have a large female audience and have grown exponentially in the last few years have sold out an o2 arena performance which for a podcast group is pretty amazing so we know who they are andrew Saltz is a part of podcaster he has worked with charlemagne with brilliant idiots he's also a comedian and we have the moment where shits and gigs go on a US tour because they're growing and they're with Andrew Schultz and this interaction causes controversy. The black girlfriend effect. This oh, is you don't know about up the other culture. Yeah, so you'll see a, a, a guy who's had a black girlfriend, all of a sudden he's got a buzz cut, like, yeah. clean yeah. shape up. Nah, yeah. 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 yeah, I like that. that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. that. <laughs> they yeah. shave their hair because they start losing it. Because they start stressing <laughs> around this black girl complaining about shit all the fucking time. <laughs> That's why they gotta shave their nah, hair. Nah, bro. White guys with black girlfriends, they, they, they grow a beard they because the there's up. more cushion when they get slapped out of the That's hilarious. I think, I think the black girlfriend effect, hmm. It might be a protective instinct, bro. You think? Protective. Yeah. Okay, before we get into was that unacceptable, is that going beyond the parameters of what comedy is? Is that policing comedy? I'm going to give you this example. You tell me if it's funny by putting it into the comments. I thought we were going to come to blows. I, I was ready. I was ready. And, and, and then, and then, right when you think we would fight, guess what he did? He picked up his phone and he called the police. <laughs> and this, this thing I'm describing is a major issue that I have with that community. Gay people are minorities until they need to be white again.
and being very brutally honest so we can solve this problem. I'm telling you right now, a black gay person would have never done that to me. Because a black gay person knows when the police shows up, they're not gonna care who called them. They don't show up like, which one of you niggers is Clifford? Okay, you seen that example? Tell me what you think of this by putting it into the comments. They look at a guy's life like it's like a buffet. <laughs> like you just can start picking out stuff, like same amount an hour, we'll take some of that. Pay for the movie, that's okay, you can keep that one, I don't like that one. <laughs> this is nice, that's yucky, that's icky. I mean, come on people, you can't choose. This girl gave me a rough time one time. She goes, well, why does a guy make more an hour to do the exact same job? I go, I'll tell you why. Because in the unlikely event that we're both on a Titanic and it starts to sink, for some screwed up reason, you get to leave with the kids and I have to stay. <laughs> no, that's why I get the dollar more an hour. You know, if there's a house fire, it's always women and children first. I gotta stand there with like the back of my shirt on fire going, let's go people, let's go, let's go! So that's how I look at it. No, it's a dollar an hour surcharge. Seriously, that if something screwed up happens, either I can't leave or I gotta like get in the way of it to give you a head start, like rabbit dog, run honey, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. You hear a bump in the night, I gotta go check it out. Like, yes, he does have a knife. So I'm sure, depending on your demographic, depending on your social upbringing, depending on your cultural upbringing, depending on a multitude of reasons, you will react vastly different to the three jokes that are at display. All have been criticized, or in my opinion, you can see. What did you say? Bro, try not to get your ass whooped. On the dead armies. Where the joke was. However, they all play into somewhat negative stereotypes about the said groups that were joked about. I have to understand myself when I see the Dave Chappelle joke that I'm more prone to laugh at that for a number of reasons. I'm the same race as Dave Chappelle. I seem to have the same background in terms of he grew up in Chicago, which has a similar demographic to London. So I will find that equally as funny. While the Bill Burr joke, although I giggled a little bit, didn't find it as funny and understand more why it's offensive. Also, I was raised by a single mom, so I will be offended by jokes that are about heavily, too heavily criticizing women. So, the question about policing comedy, policing humor. We have to understand that humor, jokes, they live in the parameters between what can be said and what shouldn't be said what people think and what people are too scared to think, what people deem as unacceptable. It lives in this awkward space and that's where you have those outbursts of laughter. <laughs> sometimes you may laugh because of the shock value, sometimes you may laugh because it's something you've heard, it's something you've always wanted to say, sometimes you may laugh because you just feel like laughing. There is no real rhyme or reason or psychological explanation to why people laugh the way they do to certain jokes. However, people do laugh, but they do offend. Comedians have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Sometimes the funniest thing to say is me. Many comedians have said, the aim is to live in that borderline. So if we know that, why are we so easily offended? And where did Andrew Schultz tip over the line? That's the black woman experience. The black woman experience is black women caring so much about the nuclear black family, black women taking care of young black men to teach them how to be leaders, to teach them how to be strong, to teach them how to care about their God, about their family, and it's about their communities. And to raise their young black women to be independent enough to take care of themselves, but to understand how to support a family, how to support a man, while also understanding how to get it on your own. That's the black woman experience that I know. The reason that black women are tough is because when you're mistreated in the way that black women are, if you're not tough, you just die off. You don't survive. That's the black woman experience. And the other piece of it is too, is something that I've learned and I learned it from black women is people feel so comfortable disrespecting them because we don't respect them publicly, right? White people for so long have used the excuse, why can't I say the N-word when you say that to yourselves or call yourself that and use that in your music, which is bullshit. 
right? Or white people have said, if you're using the B word, or they say, if you're using the B word, why can't I call them that? That's bullshit as well, right? That's excuses to be certain things and be disrespectful when you shouldn't be. So when you're sitting across from Andrew Schultz and he's talking about a spirit, an experience that he can't understand because his wife is not black. You don't have the right to talk about that. You don't have the right to speak on something that you don't know. Right. And to make a joke about what the experience is, is one thing. If you're talking about haircuts and you're talking about clothing and you're talking about beards or you're comparing what our friend Travis Kelsey looked like when he was with Kayla Nicole to what he looks like now that he's with Taylor Swift. Right. That is part of it. You start to assimilate to the people around you. What you're not going to do, though, is be disrespectful and say you have to develop a defense mechanism because of alleged violence. Black women aren't violent. I think Ryan Clark, who is a part of the Pivot podcast, was a former safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers and Washington, formerly known as Washington Redskins, now Washington Commodores. What he said, the comments he made were articulate, they were point, poignant, they were put together perfectly. The whole show on that point, on the pivot, the clip will be in the comments description, was fantastic. I think they said everything great. At times, they may have sounded like a picnic. I just want to talk to you about haters for a second. Cause we all got them. Everybody got haters. The reason I say he may have sounded like a picnic because it's just so on point, so well said. Sometimes it can come across inauthentic when you are being authentic which is crazy because sometimes that means i must sound like a pick me weird isn't it anyway the put my point of it is he made a brilliant point but there's a few things i didn't like i didn't like the comment about european blacks and the differences with european blacks versus american blacks yeah i think the, the first thing is when you think about the two podcasters from the UK is we don't know if the black experience there is the same as the black experience for African Americans or black people that grew up in America. But I'll get to that later. And I do think sometimes the criticism lacked a little, just a touch of empathy for their own position and their own maybe just uncomfortableness and Andrew Sox is a big get for them. Although Fred Taylor did speak about that. Yeah, I think uh, I would agree with you, Chan. I, I just want to say, uh, I believe those guys were just happy to be in that moment. Andrew Schultz, maybe in their eyes, is a, is a big get, right? We However, the depiction of stereotypes, very poignant. And it's been spoken about enough now for us to be aware that these stereotypes are extremely problematic. The depiction of black women has its roots in the menstrual era where Caricatures of black women have been around in Western culture for centuries. They're rooted in the transatlantic slave trade when stereotypes were used to commodify black bodies and justify slavery. These characters were popularized in what Americans called minstrel shows, comedic performances in which white actors, in blackface, lampoon black people just to entertain other whites. By the early 1900s, minstrel shows were fading in popularity, but the stereotypes endured. They made the jump to film, then electronic media, and they have survived to this day. And did more to dehumanize them when you link that to the transatlantic slave trade, the institutionalized racism, which reinforces the social parameters of which slavery was allowed to thrive. We can understand the problem with these jokes depicting with black women as either total helpless helpers or sex objects or aggressive hyper masculine women who are full of anger which that joke was playing into sugar hill sexiest deadliest chicken town <laughs> The second stereotype is the Jezebel, and that's someone who is generally oversexed. Is mysterious. Her only power is in her body and in the influence she has over men. Unattainable. And then finally, the Sapphire character, I think that's seen in TV more often than anything else. Get some Kleenex, wipe your nose, cause it ain't that damn sad. The Sapphire is usually sharp tongue, manipulative woman who emasculates her husband. <laughs> 
there was actually a character called Sapphire Stevens on um, the Amazon Andy show. And I guess you think you could cook, clean, and get along just fine all by yourself. I do. The representation of the angry black women. And that's kind of metamorphosized to today where we just have sassy, angry black women who doesn't take anything from anybody. It's problematic and troubling. It's a shame that the media does such a great job of perpetuating it and continuing to perpetuate it. Wow rarely criticizing it and trying to change it. It's extremely problematic. Hence why Ryan's voice is a beacon of light in a place where there's a lot of darkness. Although it's important to say that online discourse, especially in black spaces, has improved phenomenally. Shout out to us. I have yet to see a man like ruin his family because of infidelity and be the same yeah. person after that. Either they become a better human, but there's always that regret. There's always that hole. And I wish that that's the conversation us as men should have. Like, instead of being the adult that my dad was to me, telling me like, oh, you only got one girlfriend. One day you gonna understand. I'd rather be the dude that said, hey man, when I started like devoting myself to my wife, like literally committing myself to my wife, I'm not cheating, I'm not doing nothing else, and I'm going to therapy, and I'm going to work on myself. Bro, look at my life the last six, seven years. But with that, I don't know how y'all feel. I've never heard of the black woman effect. Cause that's all I've dated. So I don't know if there's a white woman effect, a Indian woman effect, an Asian woman effect, but to, 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 to speak on black woman like that, that's all I was raised around. That's all I've ever dated. That's all I know. That's all my, you know, all I've been married to. Obviously I've only been married once. However, I do think some of the criticism comes more from this. Do you guys, do you guys, have you ever had black girlfriends? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, have you ever had white girls? Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, okay. What's your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> we love them all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Just, we love them all. Yeah. That means white. Who gets no. here? That means white. Hey, let me tell you, no. translation. Kendrick <laughs> fans, <laughs> got him! <laughs> we love them yeah, all. That's, yeah, that's royal fun. English. For Interracial relationships. Umar, are you totally against interracial relationships? I am totally against it, and I want to make sure you understand why. Mm -hmm. It's not because... <laughs> <laughs> cut, cut it out, Envy! Don't do that, Envy. I'm, I'm going to have a serious time. We have a name for it. I, cause I want... We have a name for it. Okay. The snow bunny crisis. Okay. I am against the snow bunny crisis. Black women versus white women. The sometimes over-lusting, the over fetishization that black men place on dating white women can be quite annoying. It's important to say this, that the majority of black men, about 80 to 90% of them, date within their race. Collectively, the amount of black people actually marrying outside their race is a whopping 18%. 82% of black people marry other black people. That is the overwhelming vast majority. And to go further, we have this conversation about, you know, black men taking resources out of the community when they marry white women. And then my question to that is, what resources? What resources, y'all? Are the resources in the room with y'all? They're not in the room with me. The research tells us that interracial couples with black people are most likely living in poverty. Furthermore, for all that talk about people dying in insurance and passing stuff on, interracial relationships as a whole are more likely to end in divorce than relationships where both individuals are the same race. Further poking holes into this nonsense argument is the fact that interracial relationships featuring a white woman are much more likely to end in the divorce and some niggas ain't gonna like this. When a black woman marries a white man, it's less likely that they'll end the divorce. I'm just, I'm just spitting the facts, y'all. Don't be mad at me. Why is it such a big issue though? Is not meant to distract from the fact that there is a minority of black people, often black men, who just love to talk about how much they prefer their preferences over anybody that is black. However, it is a thing that the dudes from Fresh and Fit will tell you is an easy way to get attention and go viral. Bro, let's just keep let's keep it a thousand, man. It's like if you're critical of like anything that has to do with like black women, they're gonna always get mad at you and be in their feelings and be like, oh, you're racist or you're a colorist right away. You can't win. So it's yeah. like, I figured out, bro. If you wanna go viral. 
Let's talk about black women. That's it. Yeah. That's it, bro. You're going to go viral. So because this has such virality and it is seen and consumed so much on social media, a lot of us are probably thinking that this is an accurate representation of reality and not considering the fact that the reality around you is the actual reality. Black people watching, if you walk out your house today and you're actually in community with black people, you're going to see black people of all shades and colors in community with each other, loving each other. You're going to be looking at their kids on Instagram and Facebook and recognizing their families and aspiring to that until you see that one black dude with a white girl and then suddenly all that shit disappears. I have to ask, how is this happening and why do you think this is happening? Yeah. There seems to be a over exuberance to show off that you're dating something of higher caliber. When you see black women dating black, white men, it's never to brag, it's never in a way to push down other people. They don't go on the internet and act like complete baffoons. White women are the most beautiful women in the whole entire world. I have never seen anything like it. Like, you guys are just perfect. You're the most beautiful woman in the whole entire world. You're queens, I love you, you're the best. You're the best hair, the best eyes, best body, best everything. Best personality, best character, best culture, easily relatable, you're real women. Daddy Jason loves you. I mean, Dr. Uma has been able to make a living out of this, just out of the buffoonery of how some black men act. And I really think the eyes of the criticism and the eyes of the store is on shits and gigs for a number of reasons. But one of the biggest is they seem to have a little too much fun mocking black women. And in that moment with the white and black girlfriend dialogue, they seem to do very little to not only protect, but just be mindful of what they should say about black women, especially when you look at the black audience that they have, the large black female audience they have. You could have done a better job, shits and gigglers. You could have done a better job. But I must express this point. I must make this point extremely clear that the comment Ryan Clark made and Channing Crowder made, European blacks versus African American. When you think about the two podcasters from the UK is we don't know if the black experience there is the same as the black experience for African Americans or black people that grew up in America. I think maybe that culture, the European black dude culture might be different than ours. I think might be at the heart of the criticism. So, so here's the thing. Listen, I do have empathy for what they're going through. They're young into this content yeah, game. Exactly and and, and this is what happens with a lot of people who are like, funny on the internet, but they're not comedians. So they are still concerned about cancellation. I think comedians, we understand that being funny is saying inappropriate things. Yeah. People that are upset at this, the majority of them don't even listen to the podcast. A lot of them are probably resentful of your success. And they're like, why the fuck should these guys make all this money? And they're just like reacting to stupid videos on the internet and like telling they're stories. They're just friends. I'm just friends. Oh, yeah, I'm just friends. Why can't I yeah. have millions yeah. of dollars like they have? So there's, but they don't realize that. They really think it's their community. Your community still loves you. Your community still knows you. And if you actually have a community, like you say, which I do believe you do, they're not going to immediately throw you away because of one clip where you're laughing at a clear fucking joke. See, Andrew Schultz, strangely enough, is a part of the problem. However, highlights where some of the vitriol is coming from, jealousy, jealousy of success, but I also think the European blacks versus the black American, the African American experience is the height of not only ignorance, but problems that we face in this diaspora a lot. I think for one, that it's ridiculous. If you look at the demographics in the UK, Netherlands, France, you can see how similar they are with policing, schooling, single motherhood, employment issues, unemployment issues, incarceration and over incarceration of black men. Yet African-Americans in large spaces seem to behave or just unaware or perhaps they were ignorant in that moment of that issue of those similarities 
I am for one a little annoyed and fed up about how it's, de it's depicted. You find this in USA's and US people's discussion about UK rap music, for example. And the blueprint is our blueprint. So I like that. But dude, if I, and, and when, again, when I play 2K, because we're so, the world is so opened up now, everybody's got a shot, but I can't stand listening to niggas from London rap. Pop, chop, did it pop, pop, pop. When they come, when they cop, when they cop, cop. And they go, did they throw, and they pop, and they did it pop, that shit sounds ridiculous. I actually like, you know, some of the UK, oh, UK hip hop. In fact, oh. I, even, I even went out there. I remember some years back and I just did a whole run. I interviewed a whole bunch of people, like gigs and stuff like that. Who's Everything going? ain't for everybody. Right. Every, just because it's there don't mean everybody should touch it. When I call into the street, in the block, what I say to me, what call in the block, in the block, that, 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 that. That shit sounds ridiculous. Well, to you. Where it's, they do more to mock not only the accent, not only the stories, but just the general art form. I get it. It was birthed in America, so they feel an inherent, I want to say, ownership over it. But it does more to me highlight the Black European versus African American relationship and the tension that lives there and I think for one an unnecessary tension. We can see through the exposés, the leaking of their past stories that a lot of this in my opinion is sort of blown out of proportion. Andrew Silk says it best, their core audience are not going to go anywhere. They've probably accepted that there's a little bit of coconut to them and I for one don't have a big problem with coconuts. Just accept that you're a coconut. It's not a big issue. <sighs> Lovely coconut water. Good for electrolytes, coconut water. You're a clown! Did y'all oh, hear him? Inner say there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I think a lot of the vitra is formed from jealousy. But we have to understand that comedy, and comedy itself, especially Andrew Schultz's type of comedy, is to be extreme, is to be radical, is to push the parameters of what is socially acceptable. So things that are taboo, things that we believe shouldn't be spoken about, will be spoken about by comedians. And now I'm doing comedy and I tell a joke about something and someone stands up and they go, I don't like that. Well, why not? Because I don't. Well, everyone else is laughing, but that doesn't matter because in this moment, I don't like it. So now you have to leave. You get kicked out of my show. I had an instance recently, a girl had a seizure at my show. That's how funny I am. Now, uh, talk about killing. Anyway, so uh, she had a seizure at the show. We checked on her, she was fine. She leaves, everything's good. So I started to make fun of what happened in the situation and a girl in the crowd stood up. She's like, you can't make jokes about that. That's not funny. And I asked what she did for a living. She says she was an EMT. And I was like, why didn't you help? And you know why she didn't help is because this is what we do now. We complain, but we don't help. Truthfully, it's to judge their intentions. Is their intentions to harm or educate? That is where we can gain more perspective about what's an acceptable joke and who is an acceptable joke. Is that like a personal attack or something? Or you... a joke up, I should say. Because there's times I've seen Steph London make problematic comments about black women and Maya Jamma made problematic comments about black women but I believe and I could deduce that most of the vitriol towards Steph London is because people never liked her in the first place and the reason why Maya Jamma was forgiven so quickly is because people liked her in the first place so this eye of cancellation this eye of vitriol that spans apart the dysphoria when someone there's an expose about someone's wrongdoings sometimes to do with to do more with tearing people down some of the dialogue about defending black women needs to change as well constantly labeling them as strong feeds into the stereotype as much as the comments that andrew schultz made black women are strong they are sensitive they are funny they are not funny they can be awkward they can be social they can be the whole spectrum of emotions and should be treated like human beings don't always just be labeling them strong it can be just as problematic in a compliment as it is as an insult be careful about how you police and look at humor 
and try not to take things as personal and as sensitive online. Have a bit of discernment, take your time to understand the perspective and understands of people. Perhaps shits and gigglers were not very sympathetic and apologetic in their apology. This past weekend, uh, there's been a couple of clips going around uh, from when we did a session on the Flagrant podcast. In the clip, um, Andrew was making a joke. Uh, I'm not even going to get into specifics. Making a, uh, like, frankly, like, racist joke. Yeah. And when you're in those situations, you you look at it through a lens of like, bro, if it was me, I promise you I'll stand up, I'll kick them cameras down. Yeah. I'll smack homeboy in the face. Yeah. I'll say this, I'll do that. But when you're in there, you're in shock. I'll leave that to you to discuss. I hope I've shed some light, some insight into this discussion. I hope you enjoy this episode. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. As my chair sinks, I shall sink into the abyss and return next week. Peace out, love you all. I know what that, that bay hole looks like. And obviously if I know what a bay hole looks like, I know what a tool looks like, I know what a, those balls look like, I know what a goose, I know what a whole situation looks like. Fair so fair. now I, I don't want to hear nothing. Yeah. It's just going to send me back to that moment. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'll 